Storytelling Podcast, episode number eight. And the sound's gone. <laughs> and now, here are your hosts. One of them is cute. The other two, not so much. Garrett, Zach, and Crystal. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Storytelling Podcast, the podcast that's all about fiction, fiction, and more fiction, and telling the best truths through the medium of lies. I am your host, Garrett Robinson, author of Hit Girls, Non-Zombie, and The Touch Trilogy, and with me, as always, are Z.C. Bolger, author of Danny Calloway and the Puzzle House. More on that. And V.C. Cole, uh, real name, Crystal Logothetis, author of uh, Via Rosal and the Miscellaneous Adventures of Princess Leona. Hey. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey. So this has been a big week for everybody. Yes, no kidding. Heck yeah. How close How close is Princess Leona, Crystal? I am literally waiting on the cover and uh. the kindling of the format, and then I'm ready to go. So. <laughs> the kindling. Awesome. The and kindling. I'm doing the Kindle formatting, but we're both, we're both just waiting on the cover. See, this, yes. is, where you guys, this is where you guys differ from, from me. I just want to say this, because Crystal's like, no, I want my cover to be right. Like, I want it to be good. I want it to be done by a good artist. Like, it's got to be good. And Zach, same thing. It's like, my cover's got to be good. My whole marketing strategy's got to be, like, worked out. I'm going to have the e-books and the Kindle and the paperbacks and the hardcover. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm working on the cover while I'm writing, but if I finish that fucking book and I'm not 100% sold on my cover, I'm like, fuck it, publish! <laughs> I get that shit off the letter. <laughs> I was very tempted to do that, but I, I, I'll admit a dirty little secret. I judge books by their cover. So I buy yes. books based on their cover, which I don't think anybody who's well-read should, but I do. So I wanted my Everybody cover to not does. suck. Everybody oh, does. It, it, Everybody makes immediate visual judgments. I'm the, I'm the same way. I, I mean, and, and Garrett, Garrett's totally right. I, you know, he's, he sent me a couple, like, things that we're going to be writing together. Like, hey, how about this cover? I'm like, let me try something different. Right. <laughs> you know? But, the, you know, it's, and, and I think we've come up with some pretty cool shit, you know? I think the, totally. the, the Ninja Bread Man cover is fucking awesome. It totally is, Zach, but... I have an alternative that I'm working on. I love the one that you've got, but I've got one that that could turn out to be awesome. Like, I'm fiddle-fucking around with it right now. It, right. If it turns out to be awesome, then great. If it turns out to be shitty, then I love the one that we've got. I am open to good covers. I want to see this cover. It's, uh, yeah. it's pretty awesome. I would, yeah. I would screen share it. Actually, we could screen share it, but I don't screen have Screen share? Oh. Is it yeah. a picture, or is it like a digital art? What is it? It's a composited picture. It's actually very much along the lines of uh, the Fat Vampire covers by Johnny okay. B. Truant. Um, yeah. it's, it's in a similar vein because it's a similar tone. I'm going, f like, the, the thing that I'm working on is a slightly different tone, but slightly more badass, and it has... It has possibilities into the future. I have to have a whole conversation with Zach about it. We haven't gotten five seconds to talk in a long time, but um, anyway, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Zach, what's uh, what's uh, what's been happening in your life this week? Oh, uh, you know, whatever, nothing much. I mean, <laughs> Danny Calloway is on Amazon. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even know what that sound effect was before I hit <laughs> yeah, it. It sounded like thunder. Uh, yeah, Danny Calloway got on Amazon this week. Uh, actually, just like three days ago, um, and I've been sending out the eBooks for the Kickstarter that I did, and people have been reading it and loving it. And uh, the thing that sucks about writing a full-length novel, you know, seventy-five or more thousand words, it's you send it out and you want reviews right away. But nobody's finished the fucking book because it's That's a so lie. goddamn long. Except for those who have read it before I released it. I got I got really pissed off when you tweeted that. Zach tweeted uh Zach tweeted something along the lines of waiting for that first review to come in, da da da. And I knew that it was published like essentially like pretty much before you did cuz I asked you what's your what's your ASIN number? And you told me, and I plugged it into the URL, and I went there, and I was like, "Boom! It's live!" Isn't that how it happened? Something like that. Yeah. Something like I was, that. 
Anyway. I was waiting there. I was just sitting there. <laughs> I was waiting for it to be updated. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so I immediately went on and left a review and and everything. And then Zach tweets, fucking waiting for that first review. And I I'm said, like, bitch. From, without, from, not from my beta readers. And you're well, my you beta didn't reader. tweet that. You explained no. that after I said, bitch. The fucking oh, first you, review's already you must up. You have gotten the chopped up, chopped up, up version. Because it was what? definitely in my Facebook update. Sure. So, so how many reviews do you have now, Zach? Um, one. One. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, you know what? Month. Those beta readers, I would freaking hound them down. Like, you well, owe I, me a review. I don't, I don't want. I don't like hounding for reviews. Like, it feels. He weird only likes hounding for money. You know what? I you like need. Hounding. You need Need to for freaking money. Hound I only like them down for review. Johnny, Johnny Truant, and uh, and Sean Platt for money. Dave, not so much. But the other guys, uh, because it it it, tur- it turns out bad, and he ends up quoting misquoting you on air. Um, <laughs> right, misquoting <laughs> me, making up quotes for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um. Uh. uh shit. What was I gonna say? Oh no no. Show you guys. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Look at that! Yeah. Look at that! It's the 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 actual print version of Danny Calloway, nice. and I'm still working on the background because it's a bit dark here, but um, it's gonna be, you know. Like gonna... honestly, this isn't the best resolution, but it, yeah. it, if I were you, which I'm not, which is probably a good thing. Um, I would literally just be like, that's a, like, I would put that out. I would totally put that out. No, see, it's same not, here. Yeah. Not it looks for me. Good. There's right. the, the logo on the edge is elliptic. Uh, it, it looks like an ellipse. It's supposed to be a circle and the, the background's a little bit too dark. So I'm going to tweak it. All but right. Other than that, the formatting's perfect. I fixed a lot of stuff that I was inside when I first got my first one. It was, I'm fucking excited. And that's going to go my super, fucking super stoked. Hard cover. <laughs> that's a whole um, thing. I keep thinking of things to say, and then they totally drop my mind by the time everybody you else stops Hick talking. You did Hit Girls 4 this week, right? No, Hit Girls 5. Hit Girls 4 was last wow. week. And just Oh, okay. So what I was going to say is on reviews, this is kind of an important thing. Most people, especially if they're not big reviewers, their reviews have to be approved by Amazon, and that's a little bit of a process. So, Crystal, if you went and wrote a review on Zach's book right now, it Do probably it. wouldn't publish for... I, I write reviews a lot on Amazon. Okay, so maybe like, it'd be I, faster. I wrote one on yours because I read uh, Touch and I liked oh, it a lot. Yeah, that's right. It's a short but sweet review. Um, I'm waiting for my ebook to arrive because Kickstarter's being a little bitch and keeps telling me that I need to complete the survey, which I then complete because it's already complete. And then it says, thank you, now everything's complete, but I still haven't gotten my freaking ebook. So I'm oh, nice. guessing Kickstarter's discriminating against you mean, me. Create space? No, through Kickstarter. It kept saying, you have to finish this. Oh, from me. It's from Kickstarter. Oh, okay. For your, yeah. You can just tell me that, and I'll send you the (laughs) e-book. Well, you emailed me back saying, well, did you fill out the survey? No, Kickstarter emailed you back automatically. No, I asked Zach. I I trolled his (laughs) Facebook wall, and I'm like, where's my my ebook I never got it and then he's like, well, did you fill out the survey? And I'm like, oh, crap. So then I went into my Hotmail account looked through like 500 emails and found an email from Kickstarter. Well, this is all fascinating, and I'm yeah. sure our listeners are enthralled. <laughs> so, anyway, Moving on. Uh, Hickles did release this week. We did not get Gingerbread... Okay, let me rephrase that. I did not get Gingerbread Man done in time to publish today, as was the original plan, but I promised the read... I, was, I fell really behind on this project that I'm doing with Sean Platt, which is going awesome, but... I, I, I promise you now, all of our dear listeners, hi Chrissy, that <laughs> Ninja Bread Man will be out by next Tuesday. I, I have no problem committing to that. It's going to happen. And um, it's going to be fucking wanted... sick. It's going to be so sick. Be I, did so read awesome. your, I did read your story beats, Zach. Um, I read... I scanned through them today. Oh my god. Dude, oh, that so final amazing. battle I think is fucking great. Oh. It, yes. <laughs> going to be awesome. All right, um, I want to jump onto voicemails because we have a guest coming up later, and I'm, I was supposed to invite him five minutes ago, and he's probably going, what the fuck? So I just want to uh, handle Chrissy's voicemail real fast, Let's do it. and Let's it's do a very it. interesting one, so here we go. Hi, guys. It's me again, Chrissy. I'm calling up back with another question. So what's the difference between young adults and children? I know ever since Hunger Games, Harry Potter, everything else, the lines are getting a little blurry. So, what do you think? Thanks. 
Now that that said, young adult compared to adult fiction because it it cut out briefly, but that's what she said. Right. Okay. Yeah, that is what she said. Um, okay, so uh, that's a really really good question, and actually one that didn't we get asked by like Johnny or something? Some yeah, some I, it might have been Johnny. I think so. One of yeah. one of the guys on the SPP actually asked us where we drew that line. So. Obviously, we're moving into a position of authority in this field. <laughs> Zach, do you totally want to take wrong. it? Uh, yeah, well, for me, honestly, the line has definitely been being blurred out in recent years because of the stories that are coming out. But what we get is we get like subgenres from that. Um, and if you take Harry Potter and Twilight and Hunger Games, those aren't actually con they're, they're considered crossover fiction at this point because you have young adults and adults reading them, so they be, fall into crossover fiction. Um, but what you need to look at is something like, obviously the, the obvious po points of like, if you have sex in there, obviously, well, there's exceptions to every rule because apparently, I haven't read it, Garrett has, he's a big fan, the last Twilight book apparently has some crazy sex scenes in it. Yeah, Edward and Bella like destroy a bedroom. Right, but I had a, I think, 9 or 10-year-old student at the school that I was working at was reading that book, and I was like, right. what? You know, so it, it, there are exceptions to it. Um, but, you know, sex and cursing and most death and killing, those would be closer to the adult section. But then you can look at things like vocabulary, um, look at your topic. I mean, is it a topic that kids and teens are going to want to read about? Um, you know, because if it's, you know, a kid in school with magic, obviously that's something that they're going to want to read about. But if it's, you know, some deep and philosophical, you know, story of Plato or something, you're like, it's like, okay, not that, uh, not that fun to go on. You know, there's, yeah, I just want to, I just want to put know, my two but, cents in and then, and then I want to uh, get, uh, Ed in on this. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Basically, for me, it's it's essentially a badge that's very equivalent to the the film uh, PG thirteen rating. That means that there's no cursing. There's no uh, in a film there would be no nudity. In a book there would be no like graphic sex scenes. Yes, they do have sex in Twilight, but it's a fade to black sex scene. No, they go but into the bedroom. Yeah, but if I can explain, I read an article about this, and basically what happens is, like, the reason Harry Potter is extremely violent in the last book, the reason there's sex in the last uh, Twilight, is because they consider the last books in the series to have grown with the audience, and they like justify the it in that way. Story. So they're actually, the last Harry Potter book is not considered a young adult book, even though people classify it as such, but it's legally not, and neither is the last Okay, Twilight so that, that I, I, I get that. I get that. Right. I'm, what I'm saying is young adult as a whole no swearing no curse words like if you do curse yeah. words you can't really call it young adult no graphic yeah. sex scenes um, and no uh, and and no like extreme violence people can, people can even die but you just can't have like she cut off his finger shoved it down his throat and made him choke to death on it it's like okay that's that was going to be in my kids. second book that's <laughs> actually in Hick <laughs> awesome Okay, uh, so yeah. uh, let's get um, our guest in here, and I will I'll at least send him an invite, and then we'll probably have to vamp for a couple of minutes. Pretty much our whole show is vamping, though, so I don't see what the big deal is. Uh, there's um, more to that young adult thing, so Chrissy, if you want to talk more about that, we can talk more about that off the air. Yeah. Or maybe in another episode. When Garrett's not being a time Nazi. I am totally being a time Nazi. <laughs> Dude, that should be another should book. Be, time too. Nazis. <laughs> He is time Nazi. <laughs> uh, somebody else needs to go because I'm trying to invite Ed in here. So people go. Uh, I'm well. Another thing is length. I'm just gonna jump on that really fast. Length and girth. Length and girth. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. oh god! Uh, it's uh, like word, right on the tip of his finger, isn't word, it? Word word count. You know, fi young adult is usually between fifty to ninety thousand. Under that is older kids books. It doesn't have to be, but that's the general idea. Um, my book, which is now on Amazon and able to be purchased, is right in the sweet <laughs> spot at 76,000. Um, and the font is bigger, right? That, it's pretty big. Say that again? Sorry, and the font is bigger, right? The font size uh, for the words? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on what you're, what you're reading, honestly, because, um, I mean, if you're comparing it to, like, a Dan Brown, like, Da Vinci Code, yeah. 
it's it, it's larger than that because you on um, young adult it's usually twelve point, but I don't think I don't think like the Da Vinci Code is in twelve point. I think it's actually in ten. Right. Um, I, I I thought young adult was fourteen or like twelve point five or something bigger than twelve point. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure no. it's twelve. Okay. Yeah. At least Harry. I know Harry Potter's twelve point. Okay. Yeah. Um. And I'm pretty sure that Da Vinci Code is ten. Um, there's there. Oh, and then the age of your protagonist is another big indicator. If you're now, obviously this can change because you can have adult books that your protagonist is, you know, twelve years old or whatever. But Ender's Game. Ender's Game, exactly. Um, but to me, Ender's Game is even falls into your your crossover fiction because yeah. that's great for teens and and uh, young adults. Yep. I mean, right. teens and uh, adults. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot. To go into it, something that was blurry for me was kids compared to kids books compared to young adult books because that's what I was trying to categorize mine as. I couldn't figure that out. I eventually did, but that's a tricky um, one. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's a lot more tricky than young adult to adult because they're so you can have such a drastic change in adult. You know, a sex scene automatically pretty much puts it, you know, right there, at least on the cusp. Yeah. So. Your thoughts, Crystal? No, yeah, I, I totally agree. I um, you know, I <laughs> I'm thinking of a, a some horrible book I had to read when I was twelve, and it turned out it had sex, and it was the Clan of the Cave Bear or something like that. <laughs> and the, <Yes. laughs> one of the women in it is just a slut. She's a total slut, and this is a book recommended in the sixth grade very often. From the looks right. of it, so I don't know. I just there. I think there's like, and then you know, like you look at Mark Twain. A, a lot of schools have fifth and sixth graders reading Mark Twain. Well, you know, don't, uh, don't look at Mark Twain. He's been dead for many years, and he's kind of gross now. Yeah, but, <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Don't mess Decayed. with my Mark Twain. I love me my Mark Twain, but no, but if I'm just saying, he's not looking good these right. days. Okay, if you read his books, you know, I mean, the word, excuse me, nigger yeah. appears. <laughs> quite a few times you know and they've had to, <laughs> they've had to make new versions since because it was just unacceptable to have it appear 336 times in Huckleberry fucking Finn pretty so, sure it's I unacceptable to say it with, with yeah you don't just say oh, disagree with me. I completely disagree with them ever going back and trying to change that book it is a part of history it was written the way that it was written like it is it is the way that it is, and it is an indicator of the times. I like yeah, the robot I mean, version. But I'm just saying, you know, it. I don't know. I just certain books that are out there and are being recommended for fifth and sixth graders, which are what eleven and twelve, are ridiculous. They have lots of sex. And hi there. We have hey. <laughs> oh, can't hear you, Ed. I think you may have joined muted. You might need to uh, click your uh, microphone mute in the top right. How's that? There hey, perfect. There you go. Right on, man. Good to see you guys. What's up? Hey. Pretty good. How about you? Uh, great, man. Great, great. So you're Garrett, you're Crystal, and you're Zach. Okay. Yep. Yep. Sweet. Hey, he, he's, a, he's an actual listener. <laughs> 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 so uh, this is Ed Ditto. Uh, he is an independent author, uh, also a lot of other things. Um, your two fiction titles, one of them is uh, Heart for a Warrior, right? Uh, Heart for a Hero, yeah. Heart for a Hero, and then the other one is something having to do with Cutthroat. I was supposed to write it down. I didn't. <laughs> it's called Gunrunner Moon, yeah. Gunrunner Moon. There we go. And that one looks badass. I was That's actually a kick-ass title. Zach. Yeah, Zach, you yeah. should check that out. Like based on the cover, I was like, "Yes, please." And it's sitting on my Kindle ready to go. Oh, oh yeah. Sweet. Sweet. I'll sweet. definitely check that out. It's a yeah, it's a YA nice. title and I was looking through Zach's uh, I was looking through Zach's Amazon page and it looked like you just did a YA title as well, just like yeah, a week I did. ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Congratulations, man. Thank right you. On. I'm excited. Yeah. Good deal. He's been Good working deal. on that for a while. Oh yeah? yeah, 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 yeah. It's been taking a while. I mean, I also have print coming out, so I have my hardcover and paperbacks coming out as well. Mm -hmm. But oh, yeah. it's really good. Deal. Good. good deal. Man. Yeah. Cool. So, um, Ed is also uh, the author of a nonfiction book: How to Format Your Book for <laughs> Kindle, Create Space, Nook, and everything else in an afternoon. Right? 
Right, right, which is Scrivener-based. And when I first exactly. uh, listened to your podcast, I saw that you guys were uh, Scrivener fans too. So I immediately liked you. I thought, man, okay, they're, they're, at least they use nice tools. Yeah. <laughs> so. And um, if, somebody, if somebody listening wants to get Scrivener, uh, it is available through a link on our website, which I feel obligated to mention is an affiliate link. But come on, you know, if you're going to buy it anyway. Support the cause. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um. So you, uh, the the reason that we came into contact is that I was formatting Hit Girls for print, and I had already formatted the Touch trilogy for print, and I sort of just winged it. I knew the end product that I wanted, and then I figured it all out on my own. I was happy with the final product. It took forever. I didn't have a really well worked out way to do it. But then when I was working on Hit Girls, um, I came across an article on your website. Of formatting for Create Space using uh, uh, Scrivener, right. it was amazing, and uh, I'm so happy with the finished product. And it was very fast. So, uh, and then you know we got in con uh, in contact after I wrote a blog where I mentioned you and and so on and so forth. But then it turns out that you've got this seminar that you do and this whole technology that you teach about reading like a writer, which uh, is the title of this show. Oh, cool! <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the basic idea. I mean, well, you guys have done scene breakdowns. I'm sure. Yeah. I, right. I, it, I I have. I know. Yeah. Well, it's a similar idea, and uh, it's it's this whole this kind of methodology is something I was inspired into by uh, Roger Ebert, actually. And I, mm -hmm. I'm you know, that's about hats off. You know, moment of silence yeah. for Roger Ebert this week. But uh, there was something he said uh, um, several years ago uh, to the effect that what makes a movie good isn't, you know, what it's about, but how it's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was really struck by that. I mean, you can derive a lot from that. I mean, it's a pretty profound statement, and it, it turns out to be just as applicable for books as it is for uh, and writing uh, as it is for movies. Um, right. Sort of the time I ran across that quote, I was studying uh, thriller writing with a guy named Christopher Keene. Uh, I don't know if you know, Chris Keene uh, wrote, uh, well, he wrote Steve McQueen's last movie, The Hunter, uh, okay. and he was uh, he was living in Boston at the time uh, when I was working with him. Uh, well, Chris also did a, a screenplay book. It's called uh, How to Write a Selling Screenplay. I don't know, you know if you guys have seen that or not, but it's, it's, it's no, one of the standard ones. Yeah, you can, you can find it at Barnes & Noble and stuff. It's a fairly standard book. Uh, fairly standard book on screenwriting. Um, it's, gosh, 15 years old or so, so I think maybe, you know, he's due for a refresh. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, I was working with him, and uh, he taught me a lot about, you know, the idea of literary deconstruction. Um, the idea being, kind of the analogy I use is that if you, you know, if, you, if you're a carpenter and you walk into a house, you're going to start kind of looking at how everything is put together. You have a trained eye, so you're going to see, yeah, you know, I really like how that's done. That looks a little sloppy. Uh, I've never seen that before. I might want to try that myself someday. And uh, you know, it turns out that as you as you read through a book, um, you know, you can you can do that if you'll train your eyes. Right. Um, the um, uh, you, you'll a good writer, you know, puts everything they know about the craft on every page they write. Uh, right. And so if you can, yeah, if you can just learn to see that, you're uh, uh, you're gonna you're gonna really uh, improve your craftsmanship. So. I haven't been on too many hangouts. Is the way it works is when somebody speaks, their picture pops up on the screen. That's right. Yeah. Uh, right on. So somebody was jumping in there. Was it you, Zach? Yeah. Maybe. I like Maybe. to jump in. Clearing your throat. <laughs> um, th so when when you were telling me about this, um, where I immediately made the connection was, as you said, scene breakdowns. Now, because we are uh, a storytelling podcast, we try to cater to both writing and filmmaking. Right. I'm more of a filmmaker who also writes... And uh, Zach and Crystal are more of authors, and Zach has worked on film projects with me. Um, and I learned the art of uh, the art, the the sign, the the technique of scene breakdowns. Uh, so if you're if you're a filmmaker out there, this is for you. Of take a really great scene from a really great movie. Doesn't matter what scene, what what movie, but something that you are trying to learn something from. The first time that I did this was a scene uh, from uh, I think. Uh, Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock and a, and a guy who was mentoring me at the time sat me down and we went scene by scene. First of all, we drew out the scene and we drew out where all of the uh, the tables and the walls and then where the characters moved during the scene. So that was like literally the action of the scene. Was that a dinner scene? 
I think so, yeah. Is that with yeah. Eric Sherman? I did the exact yeah. same drill with him. Yeah, it was exactly, <laughs> exactly with Eric Sherman. And, um, and then we went shot by shot, and we said, where is the camera in relation to everything that's going on in the scene? And we figured that out, and, you know, sometimes, and there were dolly moves. It was all drawn out on this massive diagram on this piece of paper, and for a, a, a you know, three-minute scene, there were, we ended up with something like 37 different camera angles. Right. Different, not and not just cutting back to the same one twice, but different spots where the camera was. And then he would say, "Okay, now in this angle, look, he's lit." And then this section of the wall surrounding his head, if you're on the YouTube, you'll see like this is dark. But then that that that's out continuity because when it cuts away, you'll see that that section of the wall is lit. But he's doing that to cast him in a dark shadow and to make him appear a more dark and ominous figure. All these kinds of things we analyzed every single frame and every lighting decision and every placement of the camera. So that's a scene breakdown. Right. Now, I never even thought of, which is stupid, I never even thought of applying this to writing until you mentioned it, but it's, it's genius. Well, you know, something Chris, I bring up Chris Keene because uh, one of his last assignments to me when I was going through some one-on-one -on -one with him on uh, thriller writing was, he said, he said, you know, next time you come over, I want you to bring any thriller, you know, any novel written by Stephen Hunter. Um, and, and I picked out, I went down to the, the co-op at Harvard, Coop, whatever it's called, and picked up uh, uh, a book called Pale Horse Coming. Uh, because of, just because of the cover, I mean, it looked like a really, really exciting book. And, I, and so I brought it back over to his, uh, brought it back over to his apartment. And he didn't even crack the pages open. He just kind of looked at the cover and then he hefted it in one hand and said, yeah, that's about right. Uh, and he handed it back to me, and he said, "Now I want you to write a sentence about every paragraph in this book." And I, you know, I kind of gulped, and I, you know, I'm like, "This is 500 pages." And he was like, "Yeah, well, you know, you wanted to study writing, right? Here's how you do it." And he, he said, uh, uh, "I want you to tell me what this paragraph is, what it does, why it's included. If you should see something that you might omit, I want you to bring that in. Um, just give me give me details." Tale about every part of this book that you can see, you know, and how it's put together. And it, my God, it took me like six weeks to do this. But it was almost like my third eye just winked on, you know. I, I, wow. I, I as I worked through this, I could, I began to really understand, um, you know, for me, that was the epiphany on how, how novels were put together. Um, it, it was like, uh, you know, taking a car apart piece by piece. Right. You're seeing, okay, this fits here, that's doing that. I understand why he skipped over from some action here to here. Why did, why did we cut from, from this location to this location? Uh, why do we have inner monologue here? Why is it, you know, everything he was doing, everything Hunter was doing in that book was, uh, you know, aimed at heightening tension. Uh, and, and you could actually go from sentence to sentence uh, and see why each sentence would work, you know, in that respect. Right. So yeah. it, it was this, for me, that was a, that, that was a watershed. You know, moment for me. Uh, so yeah, with scene awesome. break, you, you can totally do that with uh, you know with fiction. Yeah, it sounds it. like a really interesting process. It, uh, it really does, and it seems like it, it seems super super educational because yeah. there's tons of people out there who want to tell you how to write, but my my honest opinion is like, well, unless you are J.R. Tolkien or J.K. Rowling, why am I listening to you? Because mm -hmm. you're not a best-selling author, and you, you, you know, it's like, so I like this approach of teaching people how to learn rather than trying to teach them, oh, well, these are the rules. There are rules, and there are rules that are good and that everybody follows, and that's great, but this enables you to not learn from somebody who may or may not know what they're talking about. This al allows you to learn from somebody who... Well, the rules, uh, you know, conventions, you know, I, there are conventions, you know, that people follow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you bring up, I, I think you bring up a good point uh, about commercial success versus artistic success, and that's something that, you know, we should probably table for later on, but uh, the... Um, uh, the way that I got into this, uh, the idea the idea is basically that you're trying to increase the scope of your own craft, okay? There's not mm -hmm. good and bad. There's only stuff that you think would work for you and would be applicable uh, to your own craft. Mm -hmm. And there's stuff that you wouldn't want to try yourself. Uh, right. You know, um, I have, I've, been in, I, I've been in sessions uh, where I've had people uh, ding on J.K. Rowling or ding on Stephanie Meyer. You know, oh, that's pulp trash. I wouldn't want to read that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but 
I mean, let's think about some of the things that those two accomplished. I mean, like Stephanie mm -hmm. Meyer was able to uh, unite, you know, two very different markets. I mean, she was able to remind, you know, kind of middle-aged, romantically frustrated women of what it felt like to be a romantically frustrated teenager, you know, and yeah. and made a fortune doing it. So, you know, if you go by, uh, if you're going to go by commercial success, then you have to brush aside uh, Cormac McCarthy's early work, for instance, and replace, you know, him with with people like Meyer and Rowling and Stephen right. King. And, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, but, uh, and uh, and then Fifty Shades of Grey came along and reminded middle-aged women of an entirely <laughs> different kind of feeling. <laughs> I, you know, uh, honest to God, I just got back from a vacation in Florida, and I, 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 you see these husbands, you know, on the beach. They're kind of sprawled out on the beach drinking PBRs next to their wives. So and their are. wives, their wives are all sitting there reading bondage porn. I'm just like, <laughs> man, that's that's, that's funny. Is... I mean, I, I'm in Florida, and today I heard a commercial for Fifty Shades the Musical. Oh God! What? Oh my yeah. God! Oh my God! Oh gosh! Yeah, wow. I mean, what's funny about that book is that it like takes a big fat dump on every rule and everything that everybody ever said that you should never do if you want to be a well-published author, and it just spits in the face of all of that and oh, has. Porn. Yeah, it spits in the face. <laughs> which, which, if you had listened, very accurate. It, if you had listened to all the rules of how you're supposed to do things and how you're not supposed to do things, you never would have written that book. Right. right. You know what I mean? Uh, like um, um, George R. R. Martin, you know, you're not supposed to kill off your protagonist. What does he do over and over and over and over again in that series? Yeah. You know, we, so. we, I, I feel obligated to inform you that um, all, all three of us have affirmed that we, we do not particularly enjoy Game of Thrones. I have read that, more of it than any of them. Right? Yeah, either of them. Um, I... I Loved it up until people started dying for stupid reasons. He he he. I feel like he <laughs> right. kind of jumped the shark on that one, and I won't right. give any spoiler alerts. Uh, that's for my other podcast, Game of Geeks. Um, but uh, well, but yeah, and it, but it, you yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, okay. So part of the methodology that I, I I've tried to work out is that I think you should step back from your own emotional reactions right. to the material. You know and, exactly. And, you should monitor those reactions and you should say, why am I having that? You know, why, why do I feel like this is stupid? Is that something I would want to take to my own work? But yeah, yeah. Exactly. There, yeah. There's, there, as, as, much as, as much as I dislike that aspect of it, that's, from, that's coming from me as a reader. Now, right. as a writer, motherfucker right. never needs to work again a day in his life. <laughs> right, right, right. See, right. as a He's writer, I look at that and I go, oh, that's fun. Like, okay. I look at that and I'm like, oh, that would be so fun to do. I don't what know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To kill off my my protagonist, just one after another. Okay, you know, no, but because I here, brought it up to you, I was like, dude, we need to kill this person off. We need to kill that person off, like, you know. Right, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I and we will saying. get off of Game of Thrones after this, I swear. <laughs> but at the end of the first book, a very major character dies, right. and it made sense. It was like, oh, dude, okay, but I get it. And then in the middle of book three, somebody else dies. Be just like and i'm just like why like it didn't it, it wasn't it wasn't epic it wasn't cool it wasn't it, it didn't make sense for the character so that was where it lost me that that's all that i'm saying that's all that's like totally I, fine. like i like you said i actually haven't even read the books so it doesn't matter right. but motherfucker knows how to write a scene he knows <laughs> how to make some characters extremely likable Tyrion is just the greatest person oh, Tyrion, ever yeah Tyrion, the greatest one of the best characters i think in yeah in his so. He's well, we could, so, you know, there's another five hours of material here. Yeah. <laughs> you want to take the show that way? Well, but... I, I, I do have a, I do have a question. I think uh, every writer has tried to analyze a book they really like and said, okay, I'm going to sit there and I'm not going to enjoy it this time. I'm going to just read it yeah. and scrutinize it. And, and, you know, 20 pages into it, you're just like totally lost and you're in the book. You're living the adventure or whatever, and you just completely forget that you were trying to scrutinize. And that has happened to me a lot. And I think part of the reason is that I just open the book and I decide that I'm going to consciously read it. And that if the book is really good and I really like it, that only lasts about five pages. So what would be the methodology of doing that? How do you go about that? Do you specifically say, okay, I'm going to analyze uh, approximately page 23 to page 48 because that's when my favorite scene takes place? Um, or how do you even know where to begin and where to end and to pick out a specific scene in a book? Because books are not like movies where, you know, they're, they're um, as precise. 
Well, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, if you if you are writing an action scene in one of your own books, go pick out one of your favorite action scenes and do like a paragraph by paragraph. But don't get caught up in the flow. Okay, write it down as you go. I mean, stop at every sentence, every paragraph, whatever little you know block of subtext works for you. But move on it line by line deliberately, and then you know take notes about it. Um, don't, if you get caught up in that flow, you're going to get lost. Yeah. yeah, I think that paragraph to sentence thing that you were saying would handle your question, Crystal. If you sat down to analyze Harry Potter, you can get lost in Harry Potter really easily. But if See, you I actually sit down, yeah, yeah, if you sit down, you read a paragraph, and then you go, "This paragraph was written for this reason." It it, it gets right. hard to right. get. I mean, you have to discipline yourself to not like finish the paragraph and go, "All right, one more." But, right. When I was when I was uh, redoing my first chapter of my of my book, I. Because to me, the Harry Potter books are a, in a genre and they hit the audience that I want to be my books to be going to, um, which is everybody. And <laughs> what I did was... So <laughs> I, 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 I took, oxygen. called everyone. Yeah. I took the first book and that's, I did exactly what you're saying, but I took the first chapter and I broke it down because I remember when I, when I first read the first Harry Potter book, I didn't, I didn't get through it. I tried reading it three times and I couldn't get through it. And I had to break it down and figure out what what I liked and what I didn't like, because the first five chapters of that book are you know setting everything up. And I didn't get that when I was younger, but I was able to look at that now and go, okay, I can break this down. And that's how I feel like I structured my first chapter and the introduction of my characters. You know, so I, it's really interesting that you're bringing this up because I didn't even think that this was a thing. And I guess it isn't really. Right. Exposition. Kind of thing, yeah. Expo a lot of a lot of people get caught up in, you know in uh, exposition and they they either reveal too much or they you know they bore the reader early on. Uh, yeah. uh, if you look at your, some of your more formulaic, you know, thrillers, you'll find that, you know, the book opens with a big bang, there's this huge prologue with guns going off and explosions and, you know, murders and car chases and stuff like that. And then it's not until you know, 10, 15 pages in the material, a chapter in, when you start finding out the backstory of the characters who were involved in the first epilogue. But you then know, so sometimes they make the mistake of spending 60 pages giving 60, you the backstories yeah, of everybody. Exactly. And by then, everybody's passed out, you know. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, there definitely the, has to be a good balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, a lot, I think a lot of people just don't get that. I, I see um, even, you know, even your, like, you know, big big names. You know, you see that are kind of they slip up on that every once. So they get caught up in the backstory of their characters. Um, David Foster Wallace, uh, I think, was an exception to that rule. I mean, his book is like nothing. You know, Infinite Jest is like nothing but exposition. Mm. <laughs> There's so much exposition in that book, but and yet it's supremely interesting. You know, so so you can certainly pull up, pull it off. I mean, you know, here's another guy who broke all the rules, right? Another another one that reminds me of that is. Uh, Starship Troopers, the the book, not the movie. Oh yeah, the movie yeah. is just I I enjoyed it, but it's just nothing like the book. And the book is kind of like a dissertation on the society. There's a fight scene with the bugs in the beginning, and there's a fight scene with the bugs at the end, and the whole rest is boot camp and talking about the society, the space society that they've got set up. It's it's kind of just describing like how the society works and all that sort of stuff, and there's interactions between characters, but he's just telling you the whole thing. But he's fucking Heinlein, so you keep reading oh, yeah, because yeah. I mean, he invented this stuff. He gets this. Right. He, he invests you in this character, you know, Johnny Rico, and then he takes you. Um, by the time you're invested in this guy, uh, he pulls you into like a military college seminar on political philosophy and you know military philosophy, and and you sit there and eat it up, you know. Right. If he had opened the book with that. You know, there's no way. You know, it would have been a complete yawner. Um, it's one of those things where you got to know your craft. So you have to think like, how did Heinlein? We can't ask Robert A. Heinlein. You know, what were you thinking when you wrote that? You know, he's not he's not around to tell us that. Um, what I did. Oh, I can. I speak to the dead. Do you really? No. Uh, man, <laughs> I, I, brother, I don't know what you're smoking, but uh, you know, <laughs> FedEx delivers out where I am too. <laughs> but we have. Uh, um, what I did, like with that young adult novel that I mentioned, uh, Gunrunner Moon, I was at the time uh, that I wrote that, I was involved with a, a like a local uh, school group, uh, and um, you know they had a writer on board, and so they wanted me to help them develop some course material. What I did was I, I wrote that book, um, and it's I mean you know classic formulaic three act kind of fiction, but f for each chapter in that book, I also wrote 
kind of a chapter of a study guide that explained what I was thinking and why I did what I did in that chapter. Hmm. Okay, so like in the first chapter, I you know I kicked off the plot, introduced some of the characters, uh, gave people the setting and so forth, and then in the first chapter of the study guide, I explained how I did all that. You right. Know, uh, you know the the device that I did all that with. So um, that's on my website now. You can uh, you can look that up uh, at at ditto com. It's dated uh, now. It's I don't know four years old, five years old, something like that. So. Uh, I totally not, forgot to plug your website. It is eddito e d d i t t o dot com, and he's got if you if you man if you're an indie author, he's got amazing resources on there. He's got formatting for CreateSpace, formatting for Kindle, um, a whole bunch of different writing uh, techniques and and tips and tricks that just uh, you should check it out. Oh, thank, uh, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned. Um, Telling about the process of it, and it's funny that you say that because I, I, Garrett's read this part, but I did the same thing recently for an ebook that I sent out um, about telling about the different parts of of how I basically thought up certain parts of the story, and I'm actually in the process of writing um, a lesson plan for my book for schools, you know, because oh, I have yeah, schools cool. ordering, you know boxes of my book and I want them to have lesson plans to go along with it so they don't have to make up their own and it's interesting like I want to I want to incorporate this whole like scene breakdown thing mm -hmm. you know? yeah you should uh, you know tell people uh, you know not just here's what it is but here's how you do it here's how yeah. I did it anyway you know and, and don't claim to have all the answers I certainly don't you know I'm just yeah, I just know. know what works for me right. uh, so it's, that yeah answers. that's that's the approach that I try to take um, I always have an answer <laughs> Not always right, yeah. whether it's right or wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always have an opinion. Um, so, so it seems like the uses are kind of twofold in that you can do it just for yourself in order to learn how to become a better writer, and then you can also use it to connect with your reader a lot better. That's actually, that's actually, I, I never even thought about doing that before. Zach's a very generous giving person. He hasn't even like like before he'd even published his first book, he was like, how can I give back to the community? How can I help my school with this? And I'm more just like, write, write more, write again, write faster. So. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Well, go ahead, Zach. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, I saw you pop up. Um, the Oh God, where were we, man? There's just so much, so much <laughs> oh, information. The, the, in the different uses of the technology. You teach us as a seminar, right? Yeah, um, I, it's what I, what I do is I actually I actually go into uh, a room with people and a screen projector in my laptop, and I show a piece of film. Uh, it, unfortunately, this is not a technique that lends itself well to being taught on paper in a classroom setting. Okay, if mm -hmm. each of it, if I hand out, you know, 30 copies of a chapter of, you know, some book and I say, okay, everybody read quietly or read aloud, we're right. back in high school literature class, people are late for the door. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll put up, uh, you know, depending on how much time I have, I'll put up, um, you know, a, a, a few minutes or, or a half hour of, of a piece of cinema, but I'll take a very, uh, you know, writing oriented uh, approach to it. Uh, I, I won't, you know, I won't really talk about camera angles and lighting and so forth. I'll talk about, well, why would, why would we take the plot in this direction? You know, why is it necessary that these people are here? What's missing? Uh, how is this? How does this play to the audience? You know, and I, right. I get people thinking about what was going on in the in the head of the screenwriter. Yeah, uh, and we can do that right now if you want to. I've got something. I cook something up if you guys want to. That'd be awesome. Are you serious? Yeah, totally. Yeah, sure. You want to? Uh, this is fun, man. Um, and, and okay, so do you know how to screen share? Uh, no, but I. This is it's a YouTube video, so I mean we can totally. Uh, if you'll talk so me Garrett, through it, we'll why do did it. you screen okay, share? Okay, so on the on the on the left uh, portion of your actually hold on. Oh, I see. You got, does everybody have YouTube there? I see YouTube right here. Yeah, but why, Garrett, Garrett, why, why don't you screen share it, and that way whoever's no 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 we're gonna do something even better. We're gonna do YouTube. Here, um, can I just paste you, it in the see the YouTube icon on the left? Yeah, Crystal, you're muted. Just see. Sorry, um, but okay. will our audience be able to see it if I'm we go on positive, YouTube? I'm positive, and if not, well, then you know we're we're, we're still going to be talking through it. Hey, better off undead did it for Birdemic. We can do this. <laughs> Let's give right. it a shot. Let's yeah, it could be fun. What's um, okay? So do I click? On, I click on this YouTube link. Yeah, click on YouTube. YouTube. We all have to be in in order to YouTube, see the video. YouTube gadget wants to manage my YouTube. Where am I account. looking at this, Garrett? 
Yeah. It's on the uh, left over where you've got chat and screen share and cameraman and all that stuff. Oh, wait. Yeah. You... Okay. YouTube. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, this just seems pretty straightforward so far. Um, so nobody touch the controls. Ed, Ed's in, in charge here. All so, right. um Oh, damn it. All right, hang no, on. No, good. What, what happened? <laughs> Is this what we're supposed to be watching? Surely you guys have seen that before. No. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure if that's what you were intending to show Oh my us. god. Oh my Oh my god, oh my god, this is, oh wow, I have, uh, how old are you guys? <laughs> well, I'm I've seen it, I'm don't the answer. youngest, no, Zach's the youngest, but by like 20 days. Oh, not bad, well, I, okay. I'm the old hag here. Let me, yeah, oh god, I'm the old hag. Uh, <laughs> you're not a hag, you're a man, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just for so the, just for the podcast listeners real quick, and Johnny be true, and I'm sorry, I'm sure that pissed you off, uh, we just watched the Where's the Beef commercial from we Wendy's. We just watched the Where's the Beef, well, okay piece of writing and it's also 30 seconds long so it fits right. into a format like this um, where's the beef uh, just to put it in context 1984 uh, Wendy Sandbergers had had gone public uh, you know and, and they but they were really struggling and they needed to look unique they needed to kind of take the fight to the to the bigger uh, bigger hamburger chains mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so this was this was sort of how they came after it Am I muted? Uh, no, not now. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're all muted. Somebody hit play, and all the voices get muted when you hit play. Are oh, we? Okay. Are I we didn't. Gonna, are we going to be doing more videos, Ed? I would like to be able to talk over this video while it's playing. Okay. Well, right below where the video actually plays, there's a little push to talk button, a green one, and yep. you just you just click like hold your button, like click on that and hold it down when you want to talk. Okay. Oh, here we go. Right on. Yeah. There you got it. Have the, I'm not getting playback. I'm not getting playback of the video itself. Uh, well, if if somebody else wants to fiddle around with the technology, I can uh, at least tell you what I was going to try to tell you. I I yeah, it keeps playing for me. Oh, is it still it's playing, playing for you? you? Oh yeah, it's playing for me yeah. with audio yeah. and everything. Oh, not for me. I, what I want to encourage, I'm going to stop it on my computer right. here. Um, what I want to encourage people to do is just pull the video up on YouTube. Where's the beef? You know, it's right there. It's easy to search for. Uh, just pull up the first frame. Okay, so you've got these you've got these three adorable little old ladies that are standing in front of what looks like uh, um, a fast food restaurant uh, with a big sign in the back, you know, home of the home of the fluffy bun, and they're standing around this monstrous, you know, kind of weird looking. Uh, uh, cheeseburger-esque uh, piece of food and you know before we even start the frame let's think about what we're seeing okay uh, you've that first frame looks nothing at all like any fast food restaurant anybody's ever been in I mean it's the background is basically a tic-tac-toe board uh, right. with what looks like tables no chairs yep. somebody hit are we, play are we back no no we all got muted I don't know, man. Well, at any rate, um, it's possible. So the so we were talking about the setting. Um, everything that you see here basically is the platonic ideal. Okay, uh, old women really don't look like this. A fast food place doesn't really look like that. A cheeseburger doesn't really look like that. But you know, for some reason that conjures up all that imagery in your mind. And it turns out that in fiction we do the same thing. It's not necessary to describe every last throw pillow in a living room, you know, every ribbon on a boiler, every every nail in a house. Okay, you can use, there are just a few well-chosen details uh, that conjure all that up. And that's because your readers come pre-programmed 
uh, with all this imagery in their heads. And you can just push that button for them, uh, and then they've got all that back. If I say the word, you know, if I say the word algebra, you know, you guys, <laughs> I'll put you guys back in junior high school. Right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take much. You know, it doesn't take much. Uh, I've noticed that where you can say, you, you, if you if you just say blah blah character, Joe walked into a bedroom, everybody mm -hmm. substitutes a different bedroom. If somebody right. says that, I immediately think of the bedroom that I uh, was in during high school. I think of a bedroom exactly that way, that shape. Not the bedroom that I live in now, not the, bed, not the bedroom in the last apartment that my wife and I lived in, the bedroom that I had when I was in high school. I don't know why particularly. But yeah. if I tried to write, Joe walked into a bedroom, and then I describe my exact bedroom the way that it was in high school, it's like you're forcing the reader to agree with your version of what a bedroom is. No, you just say, there's a bedroom, and then you right. say, there's a pile of clothes on the bed. They know what the clothes are, they know what they look like, and they know where, they, where the bed is for them to be on. Yeah, they know what a bedroom looks like. The real question yeah. is why, the real question in that example becomes why are the clothes there? Why as a writer did you want to focus on that particular element of that scene? Um, and and I, I get this question, you know, well, geez, that's complicated. How do I know what how do I know what elements to focus on? How, how do I know where to point the camera? You know, essentially. Right. Um, so, in a situation like this commercial we're watching, uh, it's enough just to present like these images of the tables and that you know and the sign in the background, and that's enough to bring a fast food restaurant to mind. Uh, if I walked into your bedroom and I saw, you know, the ordinary the the bed of you know the windows and all that stuff, I that wouldn't don't, particularly. Don't, don't Ed, don't walk into my bedroom. I, I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, uh, it's a long walk from here to Los Angeles for one thing. But <laughs> the uh, but if you had a half a dozen pinball machines up against the wall in your bedroom, that's a detail that I would probably want to focus on. You know, right. as a writer, I'd be like, why would why would this guy have pinball machines in his bedroom? What does that say about him? Right. You know, so so that's my you know. Um, if later on in the book uh, somebody was going to break into your house and uh, rifle through your safe, you know, uh, and the safe was behind a painting in your bedroom, I would need to show the painting. You know, just lots of bad up, stuff happening in my house right now. I don't know if I like <laughs> yeah, That's because you let me walk in. See, <laughs> but the uh, um, it, so. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, so again, you know, uh, here we are looking at this 30-second commercial, and we're getting all of this information as writers about what constitutes a good setting. And we haven't even started, we haven't even pushed play right. yet on the video. You know, all this is apparent, you know, just from the, just from the first frame of the video. Right. Um, if we I think look, it goes back to studying and, and learning what you want to know, because um, let's just stick with the example of description for right now. Um, description works differently for different people and different people handle it different ways. George R. R. Martin describes the shit out of a scene right. often before anything happens. Perfect counterpoint, because he's one of my favorite authors, is Orson Scott Card. In Ender's Game, he starts in the schoolhouse. Orson Scott Card never describes that schoolhouse. He goes to a doctor's office. That doctor's office is never described. He goes to um, a plane. The plane is minimally described. He goes to battle school. The bunker, the bunk room is a little bit described. The hallways are described slightly. He goes to a game room. That's described in a little more detail. He gets to the battle room, and you are treated to 10 pages of what the battle room looks like mm -hmm. because it's so important and focused and integral to the whole story. But everywhere else is very sparse and it enhances your feeling that nothing else in life is real until you until he reached that point in his life and then shit gets real to take the coin phrase so different authors handle it different ways and that's another thing where your your studying technique would come in really helpful yeah I, I, oh sorry go ahead no it's all good I was just going to mention, you know, it's funny that you, you bring up Ender's Game because I actually had kind of an opposite reaction. I didn't like the fact that he didn't describe that much because um, I think the one exception are dystopian societies, uh, futuristic societies, or fantasy places that are really unique and they're your creation and you want them to stand out from everything else. So I think in that, in that situation, you have to be 
choice you have to make good choices in what you describe and not get into you know um, like I'd said the last uh, rug in the room but I feel like in Ender's Game the first part was kind of boring and dull because I was basically visualizing everything as a normal society uh, with a few minor well, discrepancies. It was only 30 years in the future. Like, the idea is that not much has changed on Earth, but we're in space, motherfucker. Like, that's uh, that's what I think he was trying I to mean, communicate. I mean, romantically that's speaking, that I, you know, people think that yeah. in 30 years we're going to have flying cars. So, I don't know. At least I do. <laughs> I like to think that yeah, in 30 well, they years thought that 30 good. years ago, too. Yeah. But that, that's the thing. He's, say, he's saying that, you know, it, it varies per author, you know, every author likes to do it differently. And that's going right. to sit, it's going to be, it's going to vary for your reader as well. Not every reader is going to like that. You know, I know um, that I had a friend who hated um, Great Expectations in school, and I fucking love that book, you know. Or maybe it was David mm -hmm. Copperfield, one of them, you know, so. Well, like Crystal, um, you know, we're, so what we're talking about is texture. Uh, and the, I bet that, well, okay, so sci-fi evolved, right? I mean, you, you went from, um, sort of that, I guess. It, when was when was Ender's Game published? Eighty, late eighties, mid eighties, two or eighty four. You you kind of 82. went from you went from that sort of school of, of science fiction to to cyberpunk, you know. And I bet you liked Snow Crash. Right? I, Neil, you know, I haven't. Have you have you not read Snow Crash? No, uh, I have not. Neil, no. Neil, Neil Stevenson. Crash guys. If you like if you like texture in your science fiction, if you like a lot of detail, if you like to step into that world, read Snow Crash. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, I definitely like texture. that for the books that I read. It's in my list. Yeah, especially for me, like you know, futuristic, sci fi, dystopian. I like good descriptions. I like being able yeah. to get into the story. I mean, if you imagine, for example, uh the movie um avatar in a book version you would have to describe a lot of things because it's so unusual i mean i don't care what you thought about the movie when you saw it you know it was like whoa visually stunning very different to me it was plot aside the the graphics like what you actually see the cinematography was very unique at the time oh, you're gonna you're gonna love snow crash man you're Good gonna to know. love that it's book. written yeah. down i have it right you're here love that book. it's 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 all it's dystopian it's it's uh, it's rich. but okay so uh, you know all of this all of what we've been talking about this last 15 minutes or so has has arisen from uh, just again that first frame of that video look how much you know information that we've shared that right. just arises we haven't even started talking about the characters yet right you know yep. so uh, so let's talk about them uh, <laughs> uh, we've got you've got these three uh, three little old ladies okay and uh, um, What's interesting about them, to me anyway, uh, is that they have individual personalities, but they also have a group personality. Right. Uh, you've, you've got, um, in, in the center, uh, you have kind of the sweet grandma who would never say anything bad about anybody. Um, to one side, you've got um, the, the woman who, the, the, sort of the old lady who will, um, she might drop a hint about something she finds unpleasant, but she's not. She's too polite to come right out and say it. So she's going to, you know, imply that things aren't quite right. And right. then over on the other side, uh, you've got this batty old grandma who's been drinking gin all afternoon, and you know she'll say something <laughs> that pops into her head. Is that the girl in the room? Well, what's interesting about that is that those three, uh, all everybody can identify with one of those character types. You know, we're either reserved and polite and you know we put this cheerful face on or we you know are maybe offended a little bit but you know we're not going to say anything or we're just gone so <laughs> you know and so I think the whole audience you know each each person in the audience could identify with one of those characters you understand um, them immediately you know who they are yeah you understand at least one of them at least one of them you right. click with you know uh, I think everybody would like to be the one who drinks gin all afternoon and says whatever comes into her head, but I think most of us are in the middle, you know, in that in that middle category. But then they I'm also I'm not actually this. drinking water right now. I am drinking gin. So. Oh, well, I, I had an I had an excellent beer earlier. It's gone. <laughs> Product uh, placement. How much are they paying you, Ed? That was actually my wife's homebrew, man. She's a pretty good uh, pretty good homebrewer. So. No kidding. Yeah, she's wow. good. Moonshiner, huh? Uh, it's not quite moonshine, but it's pretty damn close. <laughs> uh, so, where are you at, by the way, if I may ask? Because that uh, it's, cabin, where? It's funny. It's funny you bring up moonshine because I am in Appalachian, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I live. Yeah, yeah the, I live. The the backdrop is a dead giveaway. 
It's a log cabin. Yeah, it's a log cabin. Nice. I got a big stone fireplace I'm looking at, and we're, I, we sit on about uh, uh, 10 acres or so of land wow. up in the woods. Jeez. I got a good view of the mountains. I mean, it's, it's oh, you fun. bastard. Well, I'm I so earned this, jealous. man. I tell you, I was, uh, I, I was in Boston. I worked in Boston uh, for a financial services company for about 10 years and just burned my shit out, man. Yeah. And uh, I had to get out of there. I had to go someplace quiet. Yeah. I had to get out of there. Yeah. Hear but, that. The, uh, Sounds uh, like you have the perfect writing place now. It's a very good writing place. It's a very, very good writing place. But the disadvantage of it is, and, and one reason that I was drawn to you guys uh, after listening to your podcast is because I don't uh, get a chance to sit around and talk shop with other writers very much. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a little yeah. bit lonely in that respect. You know, I mean, if I can, you know, I can talk about football, I can talk about moonshine or deer hunting or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and those are all, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking any of that. Those are, that's fun stuff. But, uh, uh, yeah, so it, for a writer, it's like, man, how do I, do, it's, it's tough to, tough to get those kinds of opportunities. You have to, you have to court them. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely nice out there. Um, uh, I was actually talking with, uh, for, uh, the guy from the self-publishing podcast, Sean Platt, the guy, and um, and he was he was basically saying the same thing. He's he's very happy where he's at. It's great for his family, but he loves starting the self-publishing uh, podcast because the only writer that he really had to talk to on a regular basis was David Wright, and that will cause suicide. So, <laughs> um, so he's very happy about. That's that. how I feel in here in Miami. Oh, in Miami. You feel that way in Miami, huh? Wow. Yeah, because I moved here from Los Angeles. Uh, yeah. I don't know anybody out here. Right. I had more fun last year. Or I, yeah, last year? Yeah, I, was, uh, I downloaded the uh, collected works of Miami Vice uh, and oh, went wow. back through those and took like a, just a whole ton of plot notes out of those episodes. Um, and it's, uh, man, those are, there's some really fun stuff that you can pull out of those, out of those old episodes. It really is, yeah. Uh, my advice, man. Good to know. I think the the one uh, TV series that I in, I love, but I instinctively I like I look at what they're doing and the plot devices they use is actually Monk. Um, because, oh yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. Cool. I've always aspired to write, you know, murder mystery, and I've never done it because I just like I'm baffled by how they can come up with these, you know, plots that curl around themselves, and it's like, I'm not organized enough to write something like that, and intrigue <laughs> people, and make them wonder who killed, so like, I'm just too direct, I would, I would, you know, so, but I always look at them, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, they're, they're setting this thing up, or they're, they're, uh, you know, trying to, uh, change people's attention or deviate it to another place or whatever it is that they're doing, I can see it right away. So, Well, if you do want to do something like that, you should just take what Ed's taught us about and uh, go take another look at that series. Yeah, but I, I, I would have to like basically rip off one of their storylines. <laughs> well, the, a lot of the story... Well, but ripping off storylines. There... Uh, are there any new storylines? I mean, that's an intriguing question. Yeah, that's true. Mine's very uh, original, and you can get it on Amazon now. <laughs> <laughs> click, so it's mine. And, click. <laughs> and it's on, not on Amazon yet. And on yet. that massively self-promotional <laughs> note, we are uh, we are over. We're actually at about an hour ten, so uh, we should probably sign off. Ed, I can't tell oh, you how damn awesome it. it's been what? having we're you We're done. On. Oh man. I know. I know. I actually. <laughs> God. I feel we like we could talk again. about this forever. We yeah. could. Yeah, we should. We yeah, should you have, have you on back. again for sure. Sure. <laughs> like I say, I don't get much chance to do this. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, I'm, it's good to meet you. It sounds like, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like no matter where you are, you can always. This is writing is a, an art form that allows you to connect with other people very quickly. So thanks for uh, thanks, thanks for giving me a chance Definitely. to. Yeah. So everybody listening should go to edditto.com. It's e d d i t t o dot com, and you should also go buy his books on Amazon. They are Gunrunner Moon and Heart for a Hero. Right? I didn't fuck that up. Very good, very good. Okay, good, okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, that is it for this week's uh, so, uh, Storytelling Podcast. Uh, check out our website at thestorytellingpodcast.com. Leave comments. We really love hearing from you. Uh, subscribe on iTunes. And go get my book. And go get Zach's book. God damn it, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.